Diane, that paper, please. Oh. And your hat. Uh, Mr. Trisha, I demand you to have a moment of silence to remember those that have fallen. Yeah. Or and the and those actually we just lost one. I always like to dedicate it to Rob. Yeah, um, Rob Anderson. Rob Anderson. He was a member and he just passed away in the last week or so. Yeah. Community dedicated volunteer. Yeah. So this moment's for him and all the other drug um, users. And also because it is Remembrance Day for those who have passed passed away during the Burnt Country Day is free. Yep. Yeah. Vandu mission statement. Vandu is a group of users and former users who work to improve the lives of people who use illicit drugs through user-based peer support and education. Vandu is committed to increasing the capacity of people who use drugs to live healthy, productive lives. Vandu is also committed to ensuring that drug users have a real voice in their community and in the creation of programs and policies designed to serve them. I lost uh, a daughter in 94, and um, and I never knew that there was uh, any groups like with peer-to-peer -peer because I am a drug user and still am today. And then three years ago, I lost another daughter. And uh, for me, I, I really didn't feel I belonged anywhere, and Van Du really helped me in that, like where I can speak in front of people now. It gave me a chance to get, get some kind of dignity back as well as respect. Somebody said I could come in here and get $3 come to a meeting and get three dollars. I thought, great, I'd get some smoke. Yeah. And I didn't really care about what the meeting, what it was or anything, I didn't really care. I just came in, sat down, started listening and realized that, oh wow, these are people that use drugs too and they all sit here. So I, I stuck around. I thought when I came to downtown East Side that this is where I was going to die. And this is where I came alive. <laughs> like I moved here and I, I met all these people that are people. You know, they're addicts, but they're, they know they're addicts, and they can identify with that, and they own it. Where I'm used to coming from, where people are so hiding it still, and it's so bad, and everybody's so dirty, because it's dirty. They make it seem like it's something that's not supposed to be right, and hey, hell, you don't, everybody who's a drug addict knows, even those guys up in their shirts and skirts are still doing dope too, but they hide it. Do you know what I mean? And here we are, we're able to bring it out, and it just, we're not afraid. Our main goal is to help the most marginalized, and poverty-stricken people down here. They're the ones that fall through the cracks. They're the ones that don't fit in with big society, you know, the big organizations. <coughs> They're the ones that need the help most. And that's where we, each one of us, at one time or another, that's where we were. We have uh, um, re uh, harm reduction, like the screens, push sticks, mouthpieces, you know, like, uh, and then we have the needles, the condoms. The water. The water. Yeah, the water, the, yeah, alcohol swab. We have an injection site downstairs in our building, which is usually assisted injections, which is for the people who still come in and can't inject themselves. And there are a couple of us here that don't mind doing that. I've taken some lots of different testing and focus groups and stuff on how to do it safer, and we do it. We do it when we're not supposed to do it, but we do it to save your life. My name is Zoe Dodd. I'm in a number of networks, so I'm in um, the Canadian Association of People Who Use Drugs. I'm a member of that network. I'm one of the founders of the Toronto Drug Users Union, and I'm in the Toronto Overdose Prevention Society and the Toronto Harm Reduction Alliance. I've been using drugs since I was 12, 13 years old, and I've used a variety of drugs throughout my lifetime both recreationally and habitually, and continue to do so. In 2007, 2008, the Toronto Drug Us Users Union was created, um, and that was formally created uh, by myself, uh, Frank Critchlow, and Rafi Ballion, and Cheryl White. I'm one of the co-founders and co-organizers with the Toronto Overdose Prevention Society, which again is a group of people who use drugs, uh, allies, harm reduction workers, and healthcare providers who came together in the face of the overdose crisis. 1,265 wooden crosses were staked into the lawn in front of the legislature. That's how many people died in Ontario from a drug overdose last year, according to the protesters. The vigil was a rally against the provincial government after it asked the federal government for an extension to review the future of safe injection sites. One of the biggest things um, drug user activists are known for in Toronto in the last years is the opening of the illegal injection site in Moss Park, where we've been in this overdose crisis for many years now and just watching our friends and family and loved ones and co-workers and co-organizers die. 
And instead of waiting for sites, supervised consumption sites to open, we went ahead and opened one ourselves. This is a tent that has been erected here in Moss Park. Inside, 140 naloxone kits to be used against opioid overdoses. Unfortunately, there's some bylaws that are going to be broken. We know. There. We know what we're doing, um, and uh, and we just want to help save people's lives. We just don't want to go to memorials, funerals anymore. We don't want to see more dead people. That weekend, we didn't know that we were going to last in the park. We didn't know, we thought for sure that we would probably be arrested or kicked out of the park or fined. We had lawyers on hand and we didn't know we'd be operating an illegal site for almost a year. Now, although Toronto Police doesn't necessarily agree totally with an injection site like this popping up because we do have the aspect of illegal drugs coming and going, the crisis supersedes that at this point in time. We didn't anticipate that when we made the decision to go in the park and set up a site and that changed drug laws in Canada, it changed the, the laws around opening sites, uh, it changed policy, and it changed the overdose response overnight and something people who use drugs who are actively involved feel very proud about. The drug users' rights movement started in the 80s around HIV and the rates of HIV infection. Drug users became actively involved in addressing HIV, making sure that people who inject drugs are well supported, and needle exchange uh, started. And so I live in the city of Toronto where needle exchange has been around since the 80s and has some of the lowest rates of HIV amongst injection drug users because of the expansion of needle exchange programs and how many there are. And then drug user groups, specifically in Toronto, started, um, the first one that I'm aware of is I Do It, which started in the late 90s, with Cheryl White and Rafi Balian were some of the key players in that first union. Then that kind of morphed into the Safer Crack Use Coalition, which was a group here in Toronto that was there to support people who use crack. Safer Crack Use Kits really were developed here and they're like all over the world now. I think a big success in Canada is the supervised consumption services. So that started with drug users. It started with the Vancouver area network of drug users. Uh, they were really the first to implement supervised consumption service. Sometimes in our history that gets ignored, but really they, they were so instrumental at bringing that forward. The main thing that was going on that really had the drug users want to get organized was a lot of drug overdose deaths. Um, so every year there was almost 400 in the province and probably 200 in this, in this little area. So people were really, really traumatized. They also couldn't get on methadone and people were getting kicked off methadone. So it was a lot of trouble. First year 400 people joined, the second year 800 people joined, the third year 1200 people joined. So it just kept growing and growing. Vandu started, we were despised. The only thing they had going was that I was savvy enough and always wore flower dresses and had little children with me. And I could go into a room, suss out who was who, and figure out how I could basically embarrass them into continuing to fight. So, you know, that's, that's how it happened. It wasn't because the needle exchange wanted a drug user group. The needle exchange did not want us doing needle exchange. The very first meetings that, that we had in Vancouver, we didn't say, oh, we're starting a drug users union because we want injection sites and heroin prescription. We said, well, we have quite a few people in Vancouver who use drugs, which is like the other statement. And then I said, many of them who aren't able to stop using need to form a support group. You don't mind letting us use a room here for that, do you? <laughs> and it sounds like, you know, like who's going to say no? And you have to use the language like that because that's what got us the room and that's what got us going. By the time they realized that we were actually doing a drug users union, we came one day and they had changed the law. <laughs> <laughs> Harm reduction saves lives! Harm reduction saves lives! Exchange saves lives. Needle exchange saves lives. It's time that we unite. I can't tell you how happy I am to see everybody here. This is just so beautiful to see this unity. The, the voice of the most disenfranchised person 
is the one that can't be ignored. Because even though I tend not to be someone who uses drugs and I can spout all the facts about how many people have died, when someone gets up and tells their own life story about what's happened to them directly, people actually start to cry in the room and they can be, you know, provincial health officers and big shots and politicians. So that's the voice that's the most important voice to bring. People who use drugs become experts in epidemi epidemiology, that you know how drugs, I mean how disease spreads, and you know how to prevent disease, and you know what studies have been done, and you know what the results of those studies are, and you know that there's been at least 50 studies of needle exchange to show that they don't increase the amount of drug use in any area, but in fact stop the spread of disease amongst people who are already using drugs in that area. About six years ago, uh, the highest rate of HIV in the downtown east side was women who needed help injecting because they're always the last to, you know, in a partner, in a relationship, they're always the last one to get fixed. They uh, depend on somebody else to do it. They can't do themselves because their veins are small. One of our members, especially her, she was blind and her um, <coughs> husband had ended up in jail and he's the one who used to help her all the time, right? And since he went to jail, she was getting beaten up in the alleyway. She got raped and all kinds of stuff. So we, we had to do something. So with no funding or anything, we started talking about it and going out in pairs of two every day we'd go out and our um, main initiative wasn't to inject people it was to educate them to help them learn how to do it themselves and do it safely but if somebody really needed help we would help them the lights at Hastings in Maine it counts down yes. it's Van Du that did that that was the pedestrian safety right outside here where it says 30 kilometers an hour that Van Du did that too a lot of our members down here were getting hit by cars I mean, there was somebody dying out there uh, at least once a week, and people were getting hit. And uh, so the city gave us some money to find out what was happening and what could be done about it. Well, we did a good, <clears throat> good job, better than anybody else could have done. Our members went out. We, we counted cars. We counted pedestrians. We counted um, anything we could count. We had a radar, but anything that we could count that would make statistics and show. So anyway, so we got speed bumps, things like that, so it was a big win for us. And uh, right after that, we got the toilet project. There's no toilets down here. What? You get a ticket at 10, 11 o'clock at night, you got to go to the bathroom, you're homeless. There's no place to go to the bathroom. You go to the bathroom in the Lane. laneway, you get fined. It's not like and then you end up in jail. Through this, uh, the toilet project, they're open, and it's the people from Van Du that go and work there and keep it open. We're re getting more and more respect in our community as being a voice and as leaders and being part. We're getting a lot of allies, like we're being joining forces with other groups, women's groups, uh, housing groups, uh, community groups, all sorts of groups down here. It's Realizing that stuff. Van Du uh, is not just a drug user group, we are also, uh, we're for people's rights. That's why yeah. we have to keep their foot to the fire, and when they promise us something, we have to make sure they follow through with it. Yeah. Canada is a settler country, so people are really impacted by colonialism, and a lot of people I work with are Indigenous, and they feel the ramifications of colonialism, and that has continued on. There are drug user activists who are Indigenous, who really impacted by the historical context of the country. We always have a moment, um, an opening prayer for, for being on Coast Salish ter territory. It's always an honor to be able to have these meetings on their land. And I just pray to the Creator that we have a great meeting and uh, we take what we need to and leave the rest behind. All my relations. Wars is a group of Aboriginal people who use illicit drugs and or illicit alcohol who work together to improve the lives of Wars members. Thank you. I'm president of uh, Western Aboriginal Harm Reduction Society, uh, which we call Wars. Adam. Yes. Andrew. Yeah. Sure. John S. K. Yeah. Rob M. Right here. Claude. Yeah. Lisa Marie is not here. <laughs> Roberto. Yeah. Down here, it's over 50% of the people are native down here, and a lot of them, we find, uh, have HIV or Hep C, and they don't go in for the treatment. Uh, and so we're still trying to find out why that is. Another thing is about the residential schools and, and how many people are affected by it. They would take um, young individuals from the reservation 
and they would take them away from the parents and then put them in the school to assimilate them. The assimilation part would go down, but then there would be little other aspects like sexual molestation and like physical abuse and stuff. And that's what would happen to them. And then they would come back to the reservation and then like perform whatever they learned mm -hmm. on their family. And then their family like gets all messed up. And then they, they, you know, and then they get into the alcoholism, blah, blah, blah. And then they come down and they somehow wind up in here. It's because of bad stuff and they can't cope with it. So they usually t uh, try to switch to those type of vices, which is heroin, crack, or alcoholism, or, or weed, whatever, or even cutting themselves. I grew up in, as Claude was talking about, the um, residential system, and I, I'm one of the products of that. And uh, my, my, me and my three brothers were taken away. I learned very early at that age to fend for myself, look after myself, and. When I went into the residential school, that's where I learned all the words that's associated with abuse, sexual, mental, physical. Nobody cared about you, so you had to learn to make do with what you have throughout life. We got into selling prescription drugs like Valium, T3s, like all these little round happy pills. <laughs> yeah, we made good money in that too. Like my ex's wallet was like sick. <laughs> he had like two to five grand in his pocket every day. That's how much pills we used to fork out. And then 2004 is when I got into the, um, the crack cocaine and uh, like from all the nice stuff that we had. In three weeks, all that was boom, gone, nothing. And we end up um, picking cans to get our next fix, you know? If you look at the arrest rates and the numbers, um, way more Aboriginal people get charged uh, for drugs. And the judges give more time to Aboriginal people. And then once they're in jail, they end up doing their full sentences. Every possible dis, um, you know, unfairness happens to Aboriginal people, and it only keeps fueling all of this. Um, you know, like, who, if you go to a jail for an unfair reason, when you get out, don't you think you'd get high? As our movements go, it's always important for us to be rooted in other people's movements. It's important for us to be rooted in the movements that are addressing poverty, that are fighting against colonization in our countries, that fight against other types of criminalization and marginalization. I just don't want us to forget about the sex worker movement. That's, there's a lot of drug users who are in the sex worker movement, and there's a lot of sex workers in the drug user movement, and we cannot forget about their fight too. Through Bandu, I am in the uh, missing women inquiry right now. So I go there like every day as the world keeps coming up consistently. You're bearing witness for all of us here. Yeah. 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 So the uh, missing women, um, over a period of, uh, from the early 90s um, till 2002, uh, 60 women went missing and uh, probably 60 were murdered as well. It's just been terrible. And um, the inquiry now is to examine uh, that um, for four years they knew uh, there was plenty of evidence to show that there was a serial killer and he was killing a lot of the women. And uh, in the end, they found 33 women's DNA on his um, property. So um, the real tragedy is that um, no matter how many times we would say, one of, the, one of the women is my sister-in-law, we would report and report and report, and the police, of course, wouldn't take any of this seriously. So um, after the trial, yeah. which um, was uh, took a long time, they said they would do an inquiry. We have full rights of cross-examination of the witnesses, and right now they're all police. Mm -hmm. So Marlene and I are trying to figure out what we're going to ask that officer. And it's been, I think, a really empowering experience for Marlene. Mm -hmm. Through Van Du, they taught me how to public speak and how to have the confidence to walk in my, my shoes every day now, and I'm able to um, express what's what is needed to be said, and I don't just flip out and just start yelling at the, you know, at the um, person that's talking. So it's taught me restraint and common sense. The purpose of Andu being involved in the inquiry is there's a kind of way that if you say someone's a sex worker, everyone goes, ooh, sex, ooh. 
But the real story that keeps coming up over and over again from the families and the police and everyone, the police go, oh, we couldn't warn them about a serial killer because it doesn't matter if you warn those women. They'll do anything because they have to get their drugs. They'll do anything. Mm -hmm. if they, so we, our approach is to keep saying, did it ever occur to the police or to anyone um, that we needed to make sure we had accessible drug treatment, substitution therapies for um, heroin, substitution therapies for crack cocaine, um, real stuff that will really work. And um, we're able to get all the documents and see that um, all, every single one of those women now, um, they've got all the records. It, it, there's like a million documents evidently. So Marlene and I can get documents and it tells you the last date that woman went to detox and how many hours she stayed. And there's a real trend, of course, that mm -hmm. when you offer people abstinence-based uh, treatment and that's all you offer them, it the kills them. They yeah. can't do it. And then they go back to the street again. Yep. And Until each time they try, yeah, yeah. exactly, the fail, the, that they feel that they can't do something it's that they're to expected to be able to do. And to be able to raise the issue whether drug use in and of itself is a reason to take a woman's child away and the damage it causes to the woman and the child. because of this unnatural grief and this complete unfairness. There's no fair hearing when they take her child and then her return to the street is, um, re is often um, with accelerated drug use and a lot of self-destructive behavior and a very, very bad feeling. Here in Canada, if, if you're a person who uses drugs and you're a mom and you live in poverty, you're black, you're indigenous, you are more likely to have your children removed if they find out that you use drugs there was a scandal called the mother risk scandal here that tested hair follicle and it was a faulty test and thousands of these tests went out and, and people lost their children. Those people did not get their children back in the future. They were not compensated for the pain that they went through and it didn't make them a bad parent just because they used drugs. Neglect is what makes a bad parent. Drug users' rights movement is really about drug user liberation. And it's about liberating all people. And it's about liberating people from chains, from cages. It's about liberating people so that they can thrive in this world. It, uh, for me, it's all about liberation. And it's uh, about liberating people from systemic oppression and marginalization, from criminalization. And, you know, I think being part of that movement, I just. For me, it, it's a driver to see the drug war end in my lifetime, and I'm completely committed to that. Everybody wants the drug war to end. If, they're, if they don't want it to end, they're not in the right movement, because that is the number one oppressor. That is what criminalizes people and locks them up and lets them die, and, you know, we, and it stigmatizes and discriminates people against people. It, it takes one drug and says, this drug's okay, and another one and says, this one's not okay. For this one that you consume, you should be locked up and thrown away. And for this one, it's totally you know, acceptable in our society that you can consume this drug. We will end this war on drugs in your lifetime so that you don't have to live with it anymore. That we will keep fighting because that's the end that we need to see. Because I love you. <laughs> One of the problems that I see with the drug issues down here is the fact that they are still criminalized. Mm -hmm. And these are substances that have been around longer than we have, any of us. Oh. Um, these problems have not changed. And currently, uh, a little over six years ago, I was a reject from the inventor of drug wars and just say no. Um, I was illegally deported from the U.S., which threw me from being a marginalized, functional user into full-blown depression and totally dysfunctional. Uh, and using and being in a different country with completely different views and um, all of a sudden through um, after being a stroke of homelessness of uh, being put in a hotel right here all of a sudden I after a little period of time is starting to, to come out and explore again I found Van Du and uh, Van Du has re, re starting to reawake the activist that has always been in me um, and, and to, to show me that just because I have um, gone through such a major life change that I still matter. Van Du has shown me that I have a voice, that I have rights to be here, whether I use illegal, illicit drugs or not, that um, I'm not a forgotten person. Van Du has shown me that, that I'm still valuable as a human being. And part of it with me is I, want to, I really want to see big changes in the, in the drug uh, drug law policies because I think it's a shame that because of criminalization we have thrown it into the black markets 
which is just feeding people who don't mm. give a flying shit about any of us as a drug user. That's all we are. And we're putting them in Cadillacs and condos and they're putting us in caskets and that's wrong. Yes. Hell yeah, that was oh, a good yeah. one. Yeah. Why stigmatize anything? Exactly, well, yeah, it's no different either. Than yeah, yeah. whatever your choice of drug is, right? you should have the right to do it if you're not harming yourself or your community. And that's all we ask and that's what harm reduction is about. As long as you're using, you're doing whatever you're doing, as long as you're not harming yourself or your community, then, and, and be safe. You've got to be safe to live for tomorrow, whether it's abstinence-based treatment, whether it's like Probably myself, sure. I'll use drugs for the rest of my life. I've been using drugs since I was 17. I'm a functioning addict. I'm very functioning, and I'll never quit using drugs. I know that, but the do gives me a voice to be able to do it and do it with dignity. Yes. Cool. Back in the 80s, I, I, I was talking to Angela Davis, who used to be a Black Panther, and um, back in the, in, the, in, the, in the early 70s in the United States, and she, she said the prison industrial complex is going to be the number one industry. And that was back in the 1980s. And what is the biggest, biggest industry, new industry in, is prison industrial complex. They want to build prisons. It's become people who go to jail become profit centers. And that's the way they do. That's the way they want to do things. And um, they want to make money off us. They, the prison system, the mandatory minimum will guarantee people that will go to jail. And then they're going to be able to make money off people. And as she said, it will be the poor that will be in the jails. The middle class will be hired to run the jails. And the rich will own the jails. Because most jails being built now are owned privately. They're not run by the government. How could we invent, even if we tried to, how could we invent laws that were more harmful than the laws we have today. How could we, we couldn't think up other ways to do it any worse than we've done it, you know? I think, and I think that's a big telling factor, especially as it applies to a very poor community like ours. Whatever we've been doing so far is not working. And locking people up, putting them in jail is not working. Let's take it out of the hands of the cartels and let's put it in the hands of, of people that care and, and, and love one another. I think people who fought for cannabis legalization, on some level it was a big win, on another level it was a big loss. Really the whole cannabis uh, legalization is a real demonstration of um, sort of how capitalism works because the folks who are in charge of the cannabis companies who have got to like open shops, legal shops, are mostly white rich men and have really cut out people who helped bring legalization to Canada. So the cannabis industry uh, is also full of cops, like ex-cops and politicians who also, you know, enforce drug laws. We should have had it so that those people who had brought legalization here, those who had pro for provided cannabis, should have been in the industry. I used to think this activism is killing me and it's really bad for me and I should stop. And then when I stop, it was actually worse because I felt yeah. so bad not doing the activism. So yeah. it's one of those balanced things and I think we need more people to really take that view. I don't try to pretend I'm a drug user and like as I say, who didn't snort cocaine in the 70s? I mean, you know, <laughs> I didn't want as much drugs as I could get a hold of. But I find it really offensive for me to keep kind of acting like just because I did drugs, you know what I mean? I think that the 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 kind of way we're moving forward with social justice for drug users is the drug users who need social justice and yes. who are the most marginalized. And um, I don't think that non-drug users should veer away from getting involved. I think drug user groups need non-users who are capable yeah. of understanding what a democracy is, of standing aside and letting the, the group make their own decisions, mm -hmm. but doing the bits of stuff that are really tough for people who use drugs because they're constantly arrested, constantly in hospital, constantly, you know, they fight so much danger to their health um, mm -hmm. with contamination and drugs, yeah. so much danger with violence, um, being beaten up and all of the other kind of violence. They really need a non-drug users to stand with them. If we fall, well, we all fall, but we're going to get back up, right? It's they not have knocking system. us down when we're down. It's keeping us up when we're down. 
You know, we can write letters to people like, you know, on City Hall and stand up and do presentations and go to conferences all over the world. And all these people have, all of us have done this. And this is because of Van Du, they invite us because they want to know what it's like to be this. And who would ever thought that you could become a healthy person using drugs, but, and still be making, like making a difference. Nobody would ever think that there's a bunch of drug users who can change the world. Mm -hmm. And that we deserve to change the world just like anybody else, but because we're using drugs just means we got a little (laughs) extra stuff to carry, that's all. Our drug user movement is is like super harmed by criminalization because people are forced to go to a toxic drug supply. During prohibition in Canada with alcohol, people died of poisoning of alcohol and then they stopped prohibiting the sale of alcohol and they regulated and make sure people don't get a toxic supply. But we can't do the same in this drug market. And so criminalization has also fostered these new drugs, these new chemicals that are slipping through borders or manufactured here or or, you know, you can get them over the internet. And so new drugs are constantly being introduced to our mo- into the drug market and they've created the crisis that we're in and that stems from criminalization, that stems from prohibition. Criminalization of drug use has killed the people that were part of our movements. And, you know, Rafi Balian, he helped start the program at my workplace and so he um, started Counterfeit, which was a needle exchange and he worked there for many years he was so foundational in Toronto and like he wrote this book with Cheryl White Could Harm Reduction at Work and he's won awards and he was just so phenomenal and he overdosed and died going to a meeting in Vancouver about supervised injection sites which he was supposed to speak at and he never made it to the meeting. He overdosed and died in his hotel room because the drug supply was so different out there and, and, and he died. It's hard to be on your own. So like Rafi for me was like, Rafi and Becky, actually Becky Brooks in the US used to check on me all the time. And she died last year. And you know, those people, they look out for each other. They look, they're looking out for you and checking in on you and giving you advice, especially older activists. I wish they were here because I like really need it right now. Because you get chipped away at in a particular way that you don't want to be public about. Um, and especially when you're a woman. And um, it can really take a toll on you. And then what happens to activists is they also take their lives. And that isn't just, you know, they're not just overdosing, but people also make a decision to take their lives because it's just so, it's become too much for them too. And fair enough if they don't want to be here anymore, but it's also really painful, that loss. So I like actually brought Rafi's. (laughs) A D badge. I still have it. I keep it at my desk. Um, just a, a reminder of him. And like the other day, I listened to a radio show of him talking, and I hadn't listened to his voice in three years because I like I couldn't bring myself to do it. After he died, I had a breakdown because he was my fifth friend friend to die in that in that year, and uh, like I just yeah I just like miss him a lot. And so in our movements. We just really need to take care of each other because uh, there aren't too many of us.